Government Gay, Alex Reynolds series, book one. Writer, Fred Hunter, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1997. Narrator, Eric Arst. Dedicated for Joan Edwards, who told me so. Chapter 11. Jerry Lasker lived just east of State Street in one of the brownstones that have been converted from large, luxurious apartments into small, dingy ones. I parked the car illegally at the end of the block, edging the bumper up against the bumper of an ancient green Ford Mustang that was already illegally parked. It was that old game of, if my bumper is touching his and his is touching the bumper of a car that is legally parked, then we're all safe, as if the police don't think it matters what you're touching as long as it's not yourself. The address that Joe had given me was in the middle of the block, it was a dark gray building, not a brownstone, as I'd originally guessed. That was in desperate need of good sandblasting. But the result of that would probably be to uncover a lighter shade of gray. The building was three stories tall and sandwiched to so tightly between two others that it looked as if they were trying to squeeze another story out of it. There were five steps leading down to the front door of the building which made it look to me as if the entrance had been sunken into a moat. I wondered if the residents flooded it when unwanted visitors rang their bells. Peter had worried that midnight was not a good time to go calling on anyone, especially someone who might be involved in this case. He actually used the word case. I said it wasn't that late, but I was relieved when we reached the building and found that lights seemed to be on in most of the apartments. We went down the stairs into the moat and through the door into the vestibule, although from the front there appeared to be perhaps three large apartments. The left wall of the vestibule sported no less than a dozen mailboxes, and under each box was a dirty white doorbell. Each and every button had a lightning bolt shaped crack through the middle. I located the one for Jerry Lasker and pressed it. The crack apparently ran through the entire button, which made it feel squishy to the touch. The inner door buzzed and clicked almost immediately and Peter and I glanced at each other a little nervously, wondering who Lasker might be expecting because we were pretty damn sure it wasn't us. I opened the door and passed through it and Peter followed closely, letting the door close noisily behind us. We started up the staircase, which was so narrow, there wasn't even enough room for a railing, but a railing would have been redundant anyway. If you were to trip and fall, the walls were close enough together to catch you. The stairs were covered with a rust paisley carpet, with a pattern so busy I was sure it must have been chosen to help hide the dirt. It didn't work. We continued up the stairs, trusting that, like anyone else, Lasker would open his door once having buzzed in whoever it was he was expecting. Of course, we got all the way to the top of the building before we found a door that had been opened a crack. You're late, Lasker called in a lilting voice, and as he swung into the doorway coquettishly, he added a a la bacall. But I don't care. The instant transformation when he saw us was amazing. His entire body jerked to attention, his eyes bulged, and the blood drained from his already pale face, making the purple bruises appear more virulent. He grabbed the door with both hands and attempted to swing it shut, but I was too quick for him. In anticipation of his move, I had stuck my foot in the door. I had seen this done in at least a thousand movies, however, not once did I get an indication from any of them that blocking a slamming door with your foot actually hurts, especially when the suspect on the other side of the door hasn't seen the same movies you have and doesn't know that after the initial effort he is supposed to stop slamming the door and talk to you. When the door failed to close on the first attempt, Lasker glanced at it as if it had turned against him, oblivious to the fact that I was the one stopping it, and tried about six more times to slam the door, bouncing it off my foot each time and he kept yelling, Get out of here! Get away from me! With tears beginning to well up in my eyes, I finally managed to grab the door and hold it fast. Not wanting to scare Lasker any further, I didn't push the door open and walk in, 
the way they do in the aforementioned movies. And I said as quietly and calmly as I could that we really only wanted to talk to him. He continued to look skeptical and more than a little scared. Finally, I said, Jerry, I don't know what happened to you, but you've got to believe me. I didn't have anything to do with it, and I really need to know what happened because it might have some bearing on something that happened to me. Lasker looked at me blankly for a moment, then blinked a couple of times. I had the uncomfortable feeling that he was trying not to cry, but at least he seemed to be calming down. He let out a shuddering sigh and said, How did you know my name? Oh, I smiled. We have mutual friends. They recognized you at the bar. Who? He said a trace of skepticism in his voice. Joe and Sheila? You know, Joe owns on our own the store. After a minute, he brightened a little and said, Oh, yeah, Joe and Sheila. Yeah, I know them. He seemed to relax a bit, but continued to block the door. Finally, I said, Jerry, we really do need to talk to you about last Friday night. His face clouded over. You mean about the bathroom? This took me by surprise. Uh, yes. Yeah, can we come in? He thought for a moment more and then swung the door wide. Peter and I passed through. Then Lasker closed it behind us. When I turned to face him, I realized for the first time what he was wearing. He was clad in a sheer black nylon robe. I guess you'd call it. And underneath was a matching pair of bikini briefs. Two layers of nylon did not exactly leave a lot to the imagination. And ordinarily, I wouldn't be crass enough to remark upon anyone's endowment. But I have to say that if my house caught fire, I would call him before I'd call the fire department. And I have to admit, two other things... I was embarrassed to see a virtual stranger like this, and I was embarrassed that he didn't seem to be embarrassed at all. So, Peter and I began the uncomfortable game of ignoring the proverbial pink elephant in the room. I'm expecting somebody, he said as if he'd read my mind. I see, I said, and then suddenly realized that that sounded as if I'd meant it literally and amended. I, I mean, I understand. There was something else revealing about his outfit. Well... There was more than one thing, but only one that was pertinent to our investigation, and that was that it showed the rest of his body was as badly bruised as his face. There were several large bruises on his chest and side that looked as if they were transforming from purple to yellow, and a couple on his legs that I could only imagine were caused by some well-placed kicks it made me cringe to see them. I guess I'd been silent for too long because Lasker finally said a bit anxiously, so, like this guy's coming over, so whatever you want to ask me, you should go ahead. He pulled open two wooden folding chairs that had been propped up against the wall, and while we were settling ourselves in, I noticed the room for the first time. I call it a room because it was hardly an apartment. I guess this was what would qualify as an efficiency in a more modern building. This place looked as if it was half of what used to be the kitchen at a time when the whole floor was one dwelling. And it had an extremely high ceiling, which gave you the feeling of being in the bottom of a pit. The ceiling was a mass of crackling and peeling paint that looked like it had been tinted by years of chain smoking. A narrow counter stuck out of one wall, and beneath it was the smallest refrigerator I've ever seen. The one major piece of furniture was the double bed that took up most of the room. It was unmade, but partially covered by an elderly, baldly preserved quilt. There was one floor lamp in the room with an old tattered shade with gold fringe around the rim. If it carried a three-way bulb, the last two ways had already died, because the lamp barely gave off enough light to light the room. There were two large windows, one on the east wall and one on the south, that did nothing to help the overall gloom. Of course, it was the middle of the night, but the east window faced a wall that couldn't have been more than two feet away, and the south window faced the fire escape of another building. Approximately two yards away, even in broad daylight, there couldn't have been much light in this room. Lasker sat on the bed, and with a nod at Peter said, Who's this guy? Oh, I'm sorry, this is my husband. Peter Livesey? And who are you? I could feel my face turning red. God, I'm sorry. My name is Alex. Alex Reynolds? He smiled, and it occurred to me that this guy was a lot younger than I'd first thought when I'd seen him in the bar. There, when he was still intact, 
I'd assumed he was in his mid to late twenties, but now, with a few bruises, the dim light and the sheepish smile he offered us, I realized he was probably barely twenty at that. It somehow saddened me to think he'd been beaten like this while so young, though I don't know what that had to do with anything. Pleased to meet you, he said with youthful coyness. I smiled, and we fell silent for a minute. What do you want? he said, breaking the silence. I glanced at Peter, realizing for the first time that I didn't exactly know how to proceed, and all Peter's face told me was that he would rather be home in bed. I decided that the best thing to do was just come right out and ask Flasker questions point blank. Well, what I wanted to know is what happened to you. I waved my hand in the direction of the bruises on his chest and said, I mean about those. When we ran into you the other night, you said that I'd caused it. What do you mean? Lasker's eyes grew wide and Bambi-like. He sounded almost like a frightened child when he answered, I was beaten up. I was beat up by one of those guys. What guys? I said, knowing, of course, that he was talking about the clay people. I still couldn't understand how in the hell Lasker had crossed them. One of them chased me and beat me. I glanced at Peter, who repeated the question to him. What guys? Lasker turned his wide brown eyes toward me. I had to take a piss, and I walked into the bathroom, and walked in on some private thing, I guess. So you were the one who walked into the bathroom, I exclaimed in my panic to escape. I hadn't noticed who it was that had come in on us. I was just glad for the interruption. Well, it was a private thing, but not in the way you mean. I guess, he said, and his voice sounded sad as if he were made unhappy by just the memory of his bad luck. But when I realized something funny was going on, I got the hell out of there and I ran out of the fucking club and one of those guys chased me. Lasker sounded totally unnatural when he swore like a child who's trying out naughty words for size. But I don't understand, said Peter, taking the lead. Why would he chase you if all you did was happen into the bathroom at, all, at the wrong time? Lasker let a low laugh that for him I guess denoted irony. I asked him. I said that when he when he was beating me up, I kept saying, What did I do? Did he say anything? Yeah, he accused me of following them. Lasker turned his eyes back to me and added, They thought I was with you for some reason, because I walked into the bathroom. He seemed to think I was going in there to help you. I shook my head incredulously. But I don't understand. Why would they think that? We spoke before they came in. Lasker lowered his eyes and appeared to be contemplating his knees, but from the way his forehead wrinkled, it was evident that he, too, was trying to figure this out. Peter and I watched him in silence, giving him the time to reach back into his memory. At last he looked up, though his expression was doubtful. Well, they did stand by me at the bar for a little while. I mean, they didn't pay any attention to me, but they were right by me. Did you pay any attention to them? said Peter. Oh, police, said Lasker, rolling his eyes to the ceiling. If you'd seen them, you wouldn't ask that. So, I said with a slow shrug of my shoulders, there was nothing. Lasker shook his head. No, I mean, well, no. They didn't stay by me very long, except one stayed longer than the other. Really, I said. Yeah, one of them went off, the bigger one, I think. Peter and I exchanged glances. I think we both had the same idea that one of the clay people had followed Haycheck out of the bar and murdered him and the others stayed and watched me. Peter looked at Lasker and said, So there was nothing else? They had no reason to think you were interested in them? Lasker started to protest again, but Peter corrected himself. Or that you were listening to them for some reason? No, Lasker replied with a single nod of his head as if placing a period at the end of his sentence. There was a moment silent, then he suddenly added, I was really interested in the other guy, though. I could feel my eyebrows coming together again, a sure sign that I was confused. You mean the one who left? I thought you said. No, said Lasker, cutting me off. I mean the other guy. What other guy? Peter asked. The beautiful one. Lasker's eyes took on a shine, and I remembered from my youth that shine you sometimes get when you're unattached and you see an attractive possibility. Who are you talking about? I said. Oh, this guy, this guy that came up and talked to the foreign guy that stayed. The foreign guy that beat me up? Somebody come up and talk to the foreign guy, 
Somebody in the bar? Lasker rolled his eyes at me this time in that special way that youth has of letting the elders know they're being thick. Of course, somebody in the bar, this beautiful guy came up and talked to him while the other guy was away. I mean, I couldn't help but notice he was gorgeous. I don't know what he saw in the foreign guy. Did you hear anything that they said? Well, yeah, he said then as if he thought it might sound as if he were simply eavesdropping. He added quickly, I mean, not much, because they were talking kind of low, but this guy really caught my attention and I was, I wanted, you wanted to catch his, said Peter kindly. Lasker smiled at Peter. It was a nice smile, as if he was pleased to be understood. What was so beautiful about him? Lasker looked away from both of us, but his eyes were wide and he was smiling as he described this mysterious man. He was tall and he had dark hair, a little curly or sort of wavy, and this beautiful skin, I mean, clean, smooth, you know? And he had these really nice lips and an expensive suit, and he was smooth. Smooth, said Peter. Yeah, smooth, you know what I mean? He was just smooth. Peter and I glanced at each other again. Apparently we had once more gotten the same idea at the same time. Lasker was describing the bogus Mr. Martin. Lasker continued, I tried to catch his attention, but all he was interested in was that little creep. What did he say? The usual, I guess. I mean, it was a pickup, sure shit. What'd you hear? Peter asked, pressing. Lasker gave a non-committal shrudge and toyed with the hem of his rope. Not much. Well, I said, getting a little impatient, how do you know this guy was picking up the foreign guy then? This seemed to make Lasker a bit defensive, as if he thought we were doubting his word. I heard some of it. I heard a little. Like what? said Peter. Well, like this guy says to the foreign creep something about the Harris. The Harris Hotel? Yeah, something about the Harris. Or wanting this little foreign punk to come see him at the Harris, or something like that. See? A pickup. Was there anything else? asked Eric Peter. Uh, yeah, well, I think the good-looking guy gave him his phone number. He did. I said, and I could feel my forehead creasing. I just knew that, like my mother, I was going to end up with lines on my face by the end of the seat business. Yeah, he wrote it on a napkin. I tried to see it, but I couldn't. We fell silent for a minute. I was digesting this information and wondering what it meant, as I'm sure Peter was. Lasker continued to play with the hem of his robe. Did you see any of them leave? Peter said at last. You bet I did, Lasker replied with a sly smile. I watched the smooth one. He had a beautiful ass. Did he leave through the front door, I asked. Lasker looked at me as if I were nuts and said, Yeah, through the front door. Where else would he go? And then the other foreign guy, the big one, came back. And the two of them wandered away. Where'd they go? Lasker rolled his eyes again as if he thought we'd never learn. I didn't watch them. Jesus, I keep telling you. You didn't see the foreign guys again, asked Peter. Not till I went to the bathroom. Lasker looked at me and continued. Then you went flying out of there and I went flying out of there and the one guy, the guy that stayed by me at the bar, he kept after me and when he caught up with me, he beat the shit out of me. And he kept saying I was following them, and I was following you, and asking me why. But he didn't give me any chance to answer. He just kept hitting me. I mean, look at me. He waved his hands over his body as if he'd worn see-through clothing for the express purpose of showing us his wounds. He paused for a moment and said, But I finally managed. I mean, I got away from him. I didn't even try to hit him or fight back. I just tried to get away from him. And I finally did. And I ran like shit, and he followed me for a little, but he stopped and went off in the other direction, I guess. I thought about this for a minute. It at least jived with what I knew of what had gone on, and it explained his panic when he'd seen me the ne next night. And it was easy to believe that he'd accidentally crossed these people since the exact same thing had happened to me. It was likely that the little clay person had noticed Lasker paying attention to their conversation, and then assumed Lasker was coming to help me when he walked into the bathroom. 
One thing, said Peter, after what happened to you at the bar Friday night, why on earth did you go back the next night? Weren't you afraid to? Lasker looked paranoid and turned his face away from us. After a few seconds, he swallowed hard and said, Where else would I go? There was an embarrassed silence. I would have liked to comfort him, but I felt that anything I said would sound empty. After a few moments, I stood and Peter followed suit. Well, that's all we really needed to know, I said haltingly. I really appreciate you talking to us. I'm, I'm sorry you got involved in this. Lasker rose from the bed when he realized we were leaving. He actually looked disappointed. You're going? I can't think of anything else to ask you. And remember, you've got somebody coming over. He glanced at a cheap electric alarm clock that sat on the floor by the bed, its lighted dial giving off almost as much light as the sickly floor lamp. His face was unreadable. Yeah, well, he's kind of late, and I guess, well, he's probably not coming now. I looked at him again, not knowing what to say. All I could manage was, oh. He shrugged slightly and gave me a making the most of it smile and said, I just met him last night at Man Made. See, I'm trying a new place. I guess I can't expect a lot. I smiled ruefully and said, I guess not. Out on the street, I threw my arms around Peter and hugged him close to me. There were no people on the street, but I wouldn't have cared if there were. At that moment, I was so goddamn glad I had him. I would have kissed his butt on national TV if he'd wanted me to. When I released him, we started down the street, and he rubbed me my back between the shoulder blades. I know what you mean, he said. On the short drive back to the townhouse, we went over what we'd learned, or at least what we thought we'd learned. So far, well, that was revealing, Peter began. His tone implied that he was being ironic, but I wasn't quite sure whether Peter was referring to Lasker's outfit or what he'd said. Well, he might not have had hard facts. Peter turned his head toward me, his eyes narrowed, and one eyebrow was raised. All right, all right, I said laughing along with him. His outfit was peculiar. It was only a peculiar way to entertain strangers. I see nothing wrong with it as a way to entertain suitors. Peter counted his laugh replaced by a lascivious grin. I think we could make a few suppositions, given what he saw and heard. For one, continued Peter, taking it upon himself to start the list, it looks as though the big clay person and I hope to God we learn their names soon, because... I'm tired of referring to them as if they were something out of Flash Gordon. You didn't see them in the bar. That's exactly how they looked or moved. All right, all right, Peter replied with an irritation that I chalked up to the lateness of the hour. So what I was going to say is, it looks as if the big clay person is the one who killed Haycheck. Yeah, maybe, unless he just lost track of him and was cruising the bar to find him. Peter's face swiveled toward me again. Cruising? Sorry, it's the word that comes to mind. Anyway, he might have been looking for Haycheck. Yes, well, Lasker also verified that this fake Martin actually came into the bar. I can't believe I missed him. Peter leaned his elbow on the back of the seat and used his hand to prop up his head as he looked at me. It was done more for effect than anything else. You weren't cruising, remember? I fiend a nervous laugh as if I'd been caught in an indiscretion and said, Oh, yeah, I forgot. He paused for a moment and then said, Did you think he was that good looking? I glanced at him to see if he was serious, but he was presenting his poker face, so I had to wing it. Yeah, but he doesn't have your character. He broke into a smile. I was relieved. All right. I said, getting back to the matter at hand. Lasker also verified that Martin left the bar by the front door, so he probably wasn't the one who killed Haycheck. Assuming that Haycheck left by the back door. Yeah, I felt for the first time that a little light was beginning to dawn. And you know, it makes sense. Say that Haycheck dashed out the back door and the big clay person followed him and killed him? That means they knew at that point that Haycheck didn't have what they were looking for. And that's why they came after me. Peter warmed to this. That's why they were so sure that Haycheck had passed it to you. That leaves me with one question. Why did the fake Martin come into the bar at all? 
Why did he talk to the little clay person before he could correct me? I added, I know that's two questions. Oh, I understand him doing that, said Peter. I mean, in a crowded bar, you heard that Lasker said nobody could really hear them. He only caught a little of it. Why not come up and confer with his confederates? That's just it. He only conferred with one of them, Peter sighed. Who knows? Maybe one was enough. And that stuff about the Harris Hotel? What was that all about? Why would he need to tell the guy where he was staying? Why didn't the Clay people already have his number? I don't know. Maybe if he's as cagey as you think he is, he just hadn't wanted them to know where he was staying. So why tell them then? I pressed. Alex, I don't know. I'm tired. Look, this started on Friday night. It's now Monday night. Excuse me. Tuesday morning. And we still don't have anything except questions and two dead bodies. And two dead bodies, he repeated grudgingly. There was a tense silence between us, the kind that tends to happen between loved ones when they discuss important matters in the car on the way home. When they're overtired, I let it rest for a minute, then said, You know, we can't just let this go, don't you? He thought for a minute. And if his face was any indication, he looked like he'd like to argue the point. But in the end, he just shook his head and said, Yes, I know, but we can let it go for the night. We had reached Fullerton, and I circled around the front of the house before parking the car, before I wanted to see if everything looked all right. Of course, it was a wasted gesture, because everything did look all right. From the outside, and after a split second's relief, I involuntarily reminded myself that everything could be a mess inside. Like whited sepulchres. I thought irreverently, and once again was amazed at how much of the Bible a simple crisis will bring back to you. As we walked through the back garden, after putting the car away, I took Peter's hand and said, Didn't we used to know someone who worked at the Harris? Peter turned to me, and even in the darkness I could see his face lighting up in a wide smile. Stevie, he said with a laugh. Yeah, Stevie. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks. I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.